Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you all. My name is Israel Campbell, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Mediterranean Group. We also meet on Zoom. We meet on Wednesdays, only on Wednesdays at uh, 9 p.m. Jerusalem time. I'm coming to you from Jerusalem, Israel. That is 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, if, if you're further around this round earth of ours, you have to figure out the time on your own. Um, what else? Uh, yes, I am... 16,070 days sober today on the 13th of February. That is one day short of 44 years of sobriety. Should I stay sober until the end of this meeting? And I have every intention to do so. As this meeting ends, if it ends on time, and since it's being run by a group of control freaks. I'm sure it will end on time. Um, anyone that mutes the chat definitely will end a meeting on time. Um, so I have every intention. I have no alcohol in my home. I uh, simply have coffee. I'm not addicted to coffee. I just drink it so as to not get a headache. But I don't have to drink it until noon up until noon it's a choice it's a choice i make every day but it's a choice nonetheless um it's midnight now it's 11 p.m so i'm drinking it for no good damn reason except to say that i find it virtually impossible to attend alcoholics anonymous without a cup of coffee i just anyway it's great to be here. It's great to be in a newcomer's meeting, a, a beginner's meeting, we used to call them. Um, I uh, got sober in a beginner's meeting. I'll tell you a little bit about my sobriety, uh, about my life before, uh, you know, the 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 how it works version of what it was like, what happened and what it's like now to qualify as an alcoholic. Um, before I talk a little bit about my uh, the I really only picked one sentence. Um, and I'll tell you which of the almost page that they read uh, was the one sentence that I chose. They said, Andrew said, choose a sentence or page. I chose a sentence. They read a page. Anyway, what am I going to say? What can I say? This, this, uh, this thing. Um, my friends that can't come to the meeting are asking me why I'm not still talking to them on WhatsApp. Okay, here's the deal. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, I came to Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 16 years old. In early 19 Feb in early February 1980, I was 16 years old. I was in the middle of the 11th grade. Uh, I was a Irish Italian Catholic kid from Philadelphia. My name was Chris. Now it's Israel. I'm now an Orthodox Jew living in Jerusalem. I can't promise you if you work the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll become an Orthodox Jew and move to Jerusalem. I can only tell you that it has happened. If you stay here and you work the steps, you will fear a lot of things happening as a result of turning your life over your will and your life over to the care of God in step three. We all have. You'll hear others share the fearful things. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly tell you a story. A, a man named Clint, who was a sponsor of mine for a time. He died in the uh, 1990s with over 30 years of sobriety. Uh, he got sober in 1966. He went to his sponsor, who was a man named Clancy, who also passed away in uh, 2020 with over 60 years of sobriety. Um, 
Clancy was interesting in that he was nine, around AA for nine years before he got any continuous time. So if you find yourself in a pattern of being unable to stay sober, know that that's not a reason to stop coming to AA. Um, Clint went to Clancy and, and said, I'm, a, I'm afraid that if I turn my will and life over to the care of God, in step three, God is going to make me a missionary in China, which to me sounds like something God would do. I mean, God is just so vindictive that, right? I mean, any God worth its salt would make you a missionary in China if you took the chance of turning your will and life over to their care. Anyway, Clancy, being the sponsor, doesn't get into all that with Clint. He just says two things. One, he asks Clint, do you believe in God? And Clint said, absolutely not. Clint was furious with God at that juncture of his life. He had grown up in an evangelical Christian home, uh, something called the Church of the Sky in Montana. And uh, you can imagine, I, you know, Clint used to say that he was taught that sex was filthy and disgusting and should be saved for the one you love the most. That was the kind of messages he received in church. Uh, he, he said, no, Clancy, I hate God. I don't want to have anything to do with God. And Clancy didn't get into all that. He just asked a second question. He said, Clint, do you speak Chinese? And Clint said, no. And Clancy just said, and it's the, it's the answer to this dilemma. <laughs> why? If you don't believe in God and you don't speak Chinese, why would God make you a missionary in China, right? It doesn't make any sense. But many of the things we fear here in Alcoholics Anonymous don't make any sense. So to backtrack a little, I picked up my first drink when I was nine years old. I, I like to think that I waited. I say that I waited because I could have used a drink on any given day of my entire life before I picked up a drink. That was the last drink I ever took without knowing why I was taking a drink. Because from the very beginning, alcohol was a solution. The book further along on page 60, where is it? I just had it. Uh, on page 66. Right? Is that where it says we had to get down to causes and conditions? No, that's not where it says. But try, oh, it's here on 64. Our liquor is but a symptom. I'll, I want to say something different. It's not a symptom of alcoholism. It's a solution for alcoholism. Alcohol offered me a spiritual experience, a, a, a something. It was the first thing and the only thing until I met Alcoholics Anonymous that could change me fundamentally. It was the only thing in my life that had ever offered me an entire psychic change. Clancy used to say that alcohol will do, Alcoholics Anonymous will do for us slowly what alcohol did for us quickly. I want to stress this. Because it, it, Dr. Young talks about it with Bill Wilson when Bill Wilson writes to him in the early 1960s, because Dr. Young had worked with a man named Roland Hazard. Roland Hazard was the man who brought the message, though there was no message yet, to Ebby Thatcher. Ebby Thatcher was the man who brought the message, though there was no message yet, to Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson was the man that brought the message to Bob Smith, though there was no message yet, except that one alcoholic relating to another alcoholic was something profoundly different than anything else these men had ever experienced. For a second, let's look at the case of our founders. Bill Wilson, New York stockbroker, meets Bob Smith, Akron physician, a proctologist who shook a lot, which makes for an interesting clientele. Now, what I want to stress, right, Bill's in Akron. Many of you know this, and for those of you that do, please excuse me retelling the story. 
I happen to be an excellent storyteller, so it won't be that hard to listen, I promise. Bill's in Akron on a business deal that goes bad. It fails. He has no money to pay for his hotel room, and he goes to the lobby of the hotel, and I've heard it described as such. At the end of the hallway, he was the bar. And he heard the tinkling of the glasses and the easy laughter of those who drink in bars. And my understanding is he didn't want to drink. He just wanted to feel the ease and comfort that surrounds people that drink, or at least appears to. And at the other end of the hallway was a public phone. For those of you that are too young to remember a public phone, imagine your cell phone chained to a wall. Imagine leaving the house and leaving your cell phone behind, chained to the kitchen wall. You could take the phone with you, but it meant taking the whole house too. And next to the public phone, there was a church directory, a board, a kind of sandwich board standing up, telling the people of the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel everywhere in town where there was a church. And it's said that Bill called all the pastors on the list until the 10th one, asking, do you know an alcoholic? And they said no. And finally, explaining that he was an alcoholic and did they know any alcoholics? Finally, a Reverend Tonks at the end of the list said, yes, I know someone. He did not call an alcoholic. He called a woman named Henrietta Cyberling. Bill Wilson was in what was called the Oxford Groups. There was no Alcoholics Anonymous. It had not been invented. The Oxford Groups was a Christian fellowship that aimed to get people better. Let's just say that. And Henrietta Cyberling was in the Oxford groups, and she knew Dr. Bob Smith. And she said, I know an alcoholic that you can talk to. Come to my house, and I will call him. That was Saturday, the Saturday before Mother's Day, May 1935. Bill had been sober since December of 1934. No one else that Bill had worked with had gotten sober yet. Henrietta calls Ann Smith, Bob's wife, says, can you come over to the house? I have an alcoholic I'd like to introduce Bob to. And she Ann says, sorry, in, in, in that you can imagine, right? A pre-Alanon, Alanon. Bob was already passed out at the table. He'd gone out for a, to buy Anne a plant for Mother's Day, and he'd come back so wasted that he passed out at the table. But she said in that al on way, oh, we'll be over tomorrow. Don't you worry about it. And they did. They went first thing in the morning, about five in the afternoon. And I heard it from Dr. Bob's son, Bob Smith Jr., who was driving that day. He was a teenager. And he was driving, and his father said to his mother, we'll give this bird 15 minutes. And I believe what Bob was saying is, come on, Ann. I'm a doctor, for God's sake. I know about alcoholism. I know about alcoholism because I suffer from alcoholism. And I know I need to have a spiritual experience because I'm in the Oxford groups. I'm seeking a spiritual experience. I'm seeking a way to fix my alcoholism. And I'm sure privately he was thinking, no damn, or probably he was thinking, no gosh darn New York stockbroker is going to tell me about alcoholism. And instead, when he arrived... He was taken by surprise because Bob didn't, Bill didn't want to instruct Bob about what Bob had to do. Bill said, I need you, Bob. I need to share my experience with you. I need to be of service to you 
in order for me to stay sober. And that idea of one alcoholic relating to another alcoholic was the part of the equation that Bob had never known. And he was able to stay sober. He did have one slip when he went to the American Medical Association convention some weeks later. And we count the beginning of Alcoholics Anonymous to be June 10th, which is the last day that Bob drank, which Bob counted as the first day of his sobriety, which is anathema to most of us. We count the first day of our sobriety to be the first day of our sobriety, not the last day that we drank. But who are we? Bob was Bob. Okay, so I start drinking at nine. I stopped drinking at 16. Guess what? I didn't drink that much. I couldn't possibly have drank that much. I don't think I drank as much as Marianne or Patricia Goldman in Montreal. There's no way I drank as much as those two. Just look at them. Find them. Look at them. And I promise you, look at me. Innocent, cute, adorable me. And look at those two women, and there's no way I drank as much as them. But that's not what's important. How much we drank, and we like to get into the war stories, and we like to prove that we drank more than any other human being that's ever lived. The fact of the matter is none of that matters. What matters is what does alcohol do to us and for us? Alcohol was a spiritual solution. That's what Dr. Young said to Bill Wilson about Roland Hazard, the man who brought the message to Abby, who brought the message to Bill. He said that he believed that Roland was having a low-grade spiritual experience. And I believe that's what alcohol offered to me. If I'm not going to engage in the low-grade spiritual experience of drinking, I have to have a different solution. The solution that I have now is the, is the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the spiritual experience of Alcoholics Anonymous, which will eventually render me in the 10th step to be in a place. The 10th step promises say things like, it's as if the problem has been removed. Well, if the problem has been removed, I don't have the problem anymore. But I don't have the problem because I have a spiritual experience. This is my experience when I'm watching others. If I stop having a spiritual experience, I'm going to need another solution. And the only other solution I know is to drink. And so eventually I'll pick up a drink. And that's not a threat. That's a promise. Or I'll blow my brains out because I don't know how to live without a spiritual experience, without a spiritual solution, whether it comes to me in a bottle of Jack Daniels or it comes to me in a step. And what I need to do, what was read today, right, is get out of self. If alcohol is the solution, then what was the problem? The book says in the line that I didn't have read. Two minutes left. Thank you. Two minutes. Thank you. You know, I'm 44 years. I say thank you and I just, you know. When I'm done my time, I'm going to start on Patricia's time. No, not I already picked on Patricia. Kevin Mullen's going to give me a few minutes of his time. I grew up with a Kevin Mullen. You're not from Philadelphia, are you? Are you Mara Mullen's brother? Man, Mara Mullen. Talk about a spiritual experience. Okay. Really quickly. Liquor is but a symptom. Right. It's a, a symptom or a solution. So what's underneath that? We had to get down to causes and conditions. The causes and conditions are selfishness and self-centeredness, bringing me back to my line. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think, that comma we think is the root of our troubles. But what I wanted to point out, I have a dear friend who's a bit of an AA renegade who likes to say that that comment is, mis- that comma is misplaced. That we think is the root of our troubles. We alcoholics spend way too much time thinking. This is not a program about thinking. It's not a program of thinking about whether we were good or whether we were bad, whether we were great or whether we were terrible. It's not a program about thinking. It's a program about action. We don't have a chapter into action, into thinking. We have a program, a chapter into action. This is a program about taking steps. The 12 steps. The steps of getting a commitment, 
the step of getting a home group, the step of going to Zoom meetings, the step of going to live meetings, the step of getting phone numbers. That's why the chat should be open so we could get phone numbers. Okay. We're adults. We just came out of bars. We're not, we're not. Okay. Enough. I'm going to stop. It's none of my business and I'm probably never going to be here again. So you guys do whatever you want. But the action of being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous is to reach out to the newcomers. Now, I'm sure Mo's great, but it's not Mo's job to put me in touch with the newcomer. It's my job to put me in touch with the newcomer. And it's my job to get the newcomer's number. And I'll tell you why. Because I've been in AA for 44 years. When I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, on the day I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I sat in a a clubhouse and I got about 15 phone numbers, maybe 20 phone numbers. And I would have never called any of them. Are you fucking kidding me? That's why I drank. So I wouldn't have to call a stranger and say what? I'm scared. I don't know what to do. You're you're fucking delusional. If you think I would have called those people. One guy took my number. A guy named Paul P. Paul took my number and the next day he called me and he said, you want to go to a meeting tonight? I didn't want to go to a meeting. I wanted to say, Paul, I went to a meeting yesterday. But I said yes, and he picked me up. He didn't pick me up because he didn't have a car. He got a third guy, Dan Macon, who had a car to pick us up and take us to the Paola Young People's Group. And I went into that meeting, and at the beginning of the meeting, I introduced my name, my, myself by saying, my name is Chris, because I didn't have alcoholism yet. I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I had alcoholism. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous because Lizanne came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and she had alcoholism. My dear friend, Scott Redman of Blessed Memory, Scott used to say that alcoholism is contagious. We catch it through our ears. We catch it by listening to a fellow member. Bob Smith caught alcoholism from Bill Wilson. Bill Wilson caught alcoholism from Ebby Thatcher. Ebby Thatcher caught alcoholism from Roland Hazard. And so on and so on and so on. Up until this very day, when someone in this room is catching alcoholism right now and the thing why the reason you need to have alcoholism is because you can't recover unless you have alcoholism that's time thank you thanks for listening i hope you enjoyed the podcast sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way so if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.